let's talk about platform design. This is how we usually look at platform design. What's the monolith that we're trying to build? Because traditionally, a lot of thinking around uh, a lot of thinking in large organizations even today around platforms is that it's an it's an IT prerogative. And the, traditionally, the whole look or the whole idea of building IT has been extremely monolithic. So very often, as I mentioned, organizations start with technology. So the first principle of building platforms is do not start with technology. Instead, start with the interaction, design the interaction, and use the interaction design to enable the design of the infrastructure. So let's break that into two parts. If we are to look at business design, we're talking about first start with the design of the interaction. Use that to design the infrastructure that you're building. Let's look at what the interaction looks like. Let's forget platforms. Interactions have always existed in this world. And all social and economic interactions involve three kinds of exchanges. There's an exchange of information on the basis of which supply and demand meet and decide to interact with each other. And then there's an exchange of goods and services. And in exchange, there's an exchange of currency. So the actual interaction is always an exchange of these three things together. If, we, if I was to compress that, the way I, I would think of an interaction is the producer creates value and a consumer provides some currency in exchange for it. Even if one of these things breaks, the interaction fails. So you could create a platform where everybody is creating value, but if you fail to communicate feedback and the right forms of currency to the producer from the consumer, you're going to fail at your ability to repeat that value creation on a sustainable basis. Let's look at what this means when we think of platforms, because what platforms do essentially is they take an interaction and they internalize parts of it that can be made more efficient because of the platform. So essentially what platforms do is they focus on the interaction and internalize, remove all kinds of friction that could come in the way of the interaction. So let's look at the first part of the interaction that we often think of when we think of the platform because the platform is something on top of which somebody else is building something. Usually it is a producer building some form of value on top of the platform. The obvious way of thinking about value is apps, but everything that we see over here, Airbnb, producers are building availability of accommodation on top of the platform. If the platform did not exist, that accommodation would not exist. So they are actually building something because of the platform. YouTube, Kickstarter, all of these cases are essentially there's some kind of value being created on top of the platform. And when, when, I, when I think of value, they, very tactically speaking, there can be many different ways in which we look at how value is created on platforms. One is, of course, you have innovation in the form of apps being created and extension of the technology that the platform had. But depending on the kind of goods or services that are exchanged, if you're exchanging virtual goods in the interaction, content is created on top of the platform. If you're exchanging physical goods, availability and information about the goods that enable supply and demand to meet in the form of a product listing is created on top of the platform. Let's look at services. There are certain services which are highly standardized. A ride on Uber is very standardized. A stay on Airbnb is very standardized. You can create a standardized service as a listing on the platform. Or there are a whole range of services that are not standardized. Think of TaskRabbit. I, I could walk a dog, I could do 100 different things, but I don't put all of them as standardized services. So what, what matters as value, what is value on that platform is essentially the availability of a service provider. And if you think of Nest and Waze, what is value on that platform is essentially the data that is being created by something that is connected to the platform. Even something like Nest has network effects, implicit network effects. Nobody's talking to somebody else, but every thermostat is learning from every other thermostat. So there are implicit network effects involved. Just like Waze has implicit network effects. Every car that is streaming traffic data is helping build the community of traffic information, uh, the, the community knowledge around the traffic information that helps everybody else take a decision. So my, my main point over here is that if we look at what acts as value on the platform, that fundamentally de decides what is important as a metric. If content is value on the platform, then the number of producers is not important. Uh, as uh, What is more important is the repeat participation of producers and their ability to scale content creation and the liquidity of content, how fast does content get consumed. Instead, if non-standardized services are value, then what's important is the availability of the service provider, not just the number of service providers, but how often and how available the service provider is on the platform. So depending on how we define value on top of the platform, it helps us define the one key metric that determines value creation on the platform. 
Let's look at the other side of the interaction. So in exchange of value, there's always some form of currency that a consumer provides to the producer. And the key thing that the platform needs to design is ensure that this currency gets fed back to the producer. This is often not very intricately and very deliberately designed because very often we, we think that if, if the producer is doing his job, he will, and, if, and if he sees something happening, he will kind of continue participating on the platform. But it's important to figure out what are, what are the various forms of currency that the consumer can provide the producer on our platform. I'll, I'll just give a few examples. Money is an obvious currency that uh, if, there's, uh, if the platform can actually capture the transaction, it, it uh, enables a transfer. Uh, reputation is a form of currency. Um, producers may participate on a platform to, to gain reputation. If, if you take a ride on Uber, they actually ask you to rate them five, five stars because that helps them get more rides in the future. Influence is a form of currency. I don't participate on Twitter for anything else except for the influence that it gives me over time. And all of these things, if you really think of it, are, is currency. And the goal of the platform is to figure out how to communicate this currency back to the producer. If it does not do that, it's coming in the way of the repeatability of the interaction that we just talked about. This, these two things, ensuring that there's value creation and ensuring that there's the communication of currency back to the producer is what enables what is called the feedback loop on the platform eventually. And if that breaks at any point, the platform fails. In addition to this, as I mentioned, there's feedback, so there's explicit ways in which feedback has to be created. This is an example of med medium. So if you put up s something on me medium, it, it has very explicit ways of conveying feedback about what's happening with what you created on medium. In addition to this, what's important is that platforms should create a sense of progression. Because if you want to have repeatable interactions, you need to ensure that your producers feel that they are progressing on the platform. LinkedIn is able to it is able to manipulate us into giving them all of our career data by creating some form of progression. I mean, in that case, it's very tactical. It's a progress bar that shows how much of it is done. It, it asks your colleagues to help you fill your resume and things of that sort. But there are other forms of progression. And I find it really useful to study game design over here because games are so addictive because they encourage progression throughout the game. At every point, they make it just easy enough to go to the next level, but just hard enough to go to it too easily. And a similar dynamic is really important when designing platforms. So that all of that coming together makes the f uh, brings us uh, at the end of what is the first half of designing a platform, if you will, at a very high level, which is how do you dis first start with the interaction that you're enabling? The next thing that's important once you've decided the in interaction is to go and talk about the infrastructure. What is the infrastructure that's going to enable this interaction? And this part is really interesting because platforms straddle something which is a, 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 con a sort of uh, conflict of priorities. To enable inter interactions, platforms need to be plug and play. They need to allow users to plug and play easily. So a platform needs to be extremely plug and play because producers and consumers should be able to easily get onto the platform and interact with each other. But the problem with making something plug and play and making it highly open and participative is that two kinds of issues ensue. One, when everybody comes onto the platform, whenever you let everyone come onto something, you're going to have desirable and undesirable interactions. So you need to figure out a way to encourage the desirable ones and discourage the undesirable ones. So you need to have a governance mechanism for the platform. The second issue is that when you create an open and participative environment, you're inviting the problem of abundance. There's going to be a lot of abundance. And with every problem of abundance, there's a problem of search costs. The consumer is going to have much, uh, a, a much more difficult time finding what he's really looking for, and that's going to break the interaction in the long run. So essentially, what platforms need to do is they need to balance these two conflicting priorities. Build something that is open and participative, but at the same time, it's highly curated and governed. The way they do it, is they do two, two specific kinds of things. Platforms manage some form of access control for producers, which determines which kinds of producers are allowed, which kinds of actions they're allowed to do. And on the other side, they manage a filter which determines what is served to consumers. Between these two things, they essentially manage the balance between open participation and curation and governance. If you look at access control, Platforms are gatekeepers at the end of the day. Not irrational gatekeepers. 
hopefully more rational ones, hopefully more scalable and more efficient, but they are gatekeepers. And as gatekeepers, they need to ensure that they determine producer access on the basis of certain parameters. And as a result of that, they encourage desirable interactions and discourage undesirable ones. If you look at it at a, at a very high level, there, there are three points of, of access control on any platform. You could control access at the point of platform access itself. So the example that I think of here is Sitter City. It's a, it's a platform that enables uh, parents to find babysitters. So babysitters can join the platform only once they go through a whole uh, manual curation. And that's a, a curation at the point of platform access based on who you are, signals of your reputation, of platform reputation are, are incorporated into determining whether you get access to the platform. The second point of platform access uh, or access control is that you can access the platform but your ability to produce is restricted and that's what Wikipedia does. You can access the platform and you can make a few small edits but for the really large influential edits to happen you need to build influence on the platform first before you can do that. So there's another form of access control that can be levied at the point of production. A third form of access control can be levied at the point of di distribution and this is really interesting because Medium started as a, f uh, a traditionally gate-kept platform. You had editors deciding what was good and what was not. At one point, they decided that if they were going to scale, they had to scale their curation at the rate of scaling their ecosystem. Otherwise, the whole thing was going to break. So what Medium eventually did was they let users create collections and build followership for those collections. And once they opened out the platform to all sorts of writers, all of these users who had collections became the new distributed editorial workforce. So what you can do on Medium now is you can create something. There's nothing stopping you from producing. But if you want to reach the market of readers, you have to pitch your creation to one of these editors, user editors on Medium. And so there's a new access control that is being created at the point of distribution. So through a combination of where you create access control and where you allow it to be open and participative, you can manage what kind of stuff gets produced on the platform. Which leads us to the second part of uh, uh, the issue about managing this, this conflict, which is on the consumption side. And this is where the filter becomes really important, because in a world of abundance, the value lies in the filter. The value today is not in aggregation, it is in, it is in the filter. Craigslist worked in the 90s because the value was in aggregation, and today it, it's, it's built really big network effects, so that's fine, but every platform that's that comes up today really creates value in the filter that it builds to make sense of the abundance. And there are many different kinds of filters. I, I think of filters as, uh, you know, filters could be about a user's intent. So a search query on Google is a filter. It's filtering all of the index pages and showing you exactly what you need. Uh, a, a location, um, you know, when you, when you switch, off, switch on your, your mobile phone uh, on, for Uber, you're essentially setting your location as a filter and any car that passes through it is being shown to you and the most relevant one is passed on to you. So intent filters are active intent like a search query or, or they are context filters like a location, where are you, who are you, who are you is a filter uh, that Facebook has. So the whole news feed is a filter based on what you did in the past, what your friends did in the past, what you liked, what you did not like and who you complained about, all of that comes together to decide what gets shown to you in the future. So a really important part of platform design is the design of the filter. What are the factors that go into designing the filters? What are the factors that make the filter stronger with every user action that happens over time? Because that's the real role of data. Data comes in and keeps on strengthening the filter and over time, the user gets more hooked, not because there are more people producing on the platform, that's not the network effect anymore the user gets more hooked because the filter becomes scales at the rate of the scaling of the ecosystem and delivers the value of the network effect on, an, on uh, a consistent basis. If your filter scales at a rate slower than the scaling of the ecosystem, the value is actually going to go down for the user as the ecosystem scales. And we've seen that happen very often with, with quite a few platforms. So that together is essentially what happens if you think of the design of the platform around the interaction. As I mentioned, there's on the basis of this exchange, there, there might be an exchange of goods and services outside the platform and currency outside the platform. Some of it may be tracked. For example, Uber tracks the exchange of the service. A lot of others do not. Some of it may not be tracked. So let's take a few examples. Twitter is a really simple example to, to think of. No access control on the producer side. Very simple filters, just time of access and who you follow. Everything else 
doesn't really matter. What, what you're served is based on only these two parameters, and you're paying back with influence. Airbnb is slightly more complex. There's editorial and social curation on one side. Photographers come to your house. People rate you up and down. On the other side, there are certain parameters on the basis of which listings are filtered and shown to the user, and the user, the traveler, pays with money and, and reputation. 